have your Bible or Bible app, turn uh, to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible, so it's there toward the beginning. If you don't have a Bible or a Bible app with you, then uh, grab one of these. They look just like this in the pew around you. Turn to page 192 and you will find Deuteronomy chapter 6. And if you need a Bible, uh, you don't have one and you want to read the Word of God, then take one of these with you. This is our gift to you. Hey, a couple of things uh, before I dive in. Uh, Kind of a good news, bad news scenario. Uh, The good news is uh, our worship arts team has produced a Christmas CD called Calvary Christmas, and it is available for you uh, for this season. It's uh, out on a table on your way out. uh, uh, When you exit the main doors to the right, you can pick up a copy of that CD for a low, low cost of $10 or two for 20. Uh, So... uh, (laughs) I just think it's really cool that, that our worship arts team, I mean, it's our people playing the instruments, our people singing the songs, it's our kids on there. And so if that's something to interest you, if you love Christmas music, pick one up. If you're looking for uh, a gift for people, just uh, something to put in their stocking, uh, then pick one up. If you've got a friend who's just a grump, pick one up, give it to them. <laughs> Might as well annoy them. If they don't like it, they can re-gift it, okay? So I'm just saying it's... It's, uh, it's the gift of the season, so uh, that's just something that's really cool. Now, on the, on the not-so-good news side, the, uh, uh, you know, all this time we've been kind of pointing toward Christmas as being able to get in the Sweetwater Worship Center, and it doesn't look like that's going to happen. And, uh, yeah, I feel the same way. So uh, here's the reality. We can't control that. We simply are waiting for, you know, God to finish the building, and so unless he uh, miraculously <laughs> completes it overnight in the next couple of weeks, we're not going to be in there by Christmas. So, uh, but sometime in 2016, we're going to get in there and we're just going to be patient as we wait. Now, I say that because that's a faith statement. I'm, uh, you know, on my part, I'm being patient as I wait. But I also look around and realize that uh, this service is filling up to the place where people are having trouble finding a, a place to sit. And, and so I'm just going to remind you that we have Saturday night services. Uh, and and, and I, beyond a reminder, I would love it if you know, about 50 of you felt called by God to, to move to our, our 4.30 or 6 o'clock service on Saturday uh, and have great parking and plenty of seating and the same great music and the same great children's ministry uh, for at least the next you know, uh, couple of months until we get into our Sweetwater campus. So I'm just uh, saying that because some of you have that flexibility, have that ability to kind of go, hey, yeah, we could do Saturday nights and open up some seats for the guests that we know are going to be coming here on Sunday morning. So uh, I just mentioned that since we're in that good news, bad news, good news is there's a way you can serve that's uh, it's really simple. So why are we here this morning? Why are we in this place at this time? Uh, what's our purpose for being here? Okay, I heard someone say it over there, to worship. To worship God. I mean, that's we call it a worship service. You guys got up this morning and said, hey, we're going to church. We're going to go to worship. Okay, what service are we going to go to? So you came here to worship God, which begs the question, which God do we worship? Now, it used to be a simple answer because our culture was far more uh, unified in its views and its understandings of who God was. But in, in this day and age, when a lot of people define themselves as spiritual... And, and we've kind of gotten to that place where faith is a lot like beer, you know? It's not just like one or two brands anymore. It's like microbreweries. People just kind of make up their own along the way. And, and so people now kind of take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and they kind of throw it all together and say, this is what my faith is. We need to define which God we worship. And so today, uh, as we continue our core series uh, we're talking about our essential beliefs. Uh, and now, our essential beliefs are those beliefs, those five statements that we make here at Calvary that, that really allow us to unify around our mission because we agree on the five main things. Uh, we call them essential because these are the things we're not going to give any ground on. These are the things that if you want to start a fight, then you go after these things. Now, all the other teachings of a church, all the other doctrines, they're important, but we're just not going to fight about them. We're not going to fight about the spiritual gifts and how they're employed. We're not going to fight about, you know, whether or not you you have eternal security, once saved, always saved. We're not going to fight uh, about, you know, when Jesus is coming back. We're not going to, we're just for it. Uh, We're not going to fight, we're not going to fight about uh, which Bible translation to read or whether you can go to Harry Potter movies. Uh, That's just, 
That's just stuff that, that's not on the table that's going to divide us. But these essential beliefs are, are the things that, that we take really, really seriously. Now, if, if you listen to us teach about our essential beliefs and you kind of go, I'm not sure about that, that's fine. Just, just engage in some conversation. Allow us to kind of share and tell you how we got to that place. Because, uh, again, this is what brings us together, unifies us, so that we can focus on our mission. So today, we're talking about God. We're talking about God. Uh, it's kind of a big subject, and I don't have a whole lot of time. So obviously, I'm not going to cover everything. In fact, as I was writing this, I thought, great, I'm trying to deal in 25 minutes what people have spent a lifetime studying. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, I can't talk about everything. But uh, I remember being in seminary class, and just the subject of God and, and the theology introduction was like a month in, in of classes. And, and so we're just going to kind of share two doctrinal statements about God that are essential beliefs here at Calvary. And our purpose is both to inform, but really to challenge you at this crucial point. Do you know the living God? Do you have a relationship with him? Because my desire is that you would know God and you would love God and that your life would be changed by his presence in you. Uh, so first statement, there is one God revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I ask you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, and we're going to look at verses 4 and 5. This is called the Shema. Uh, it, it is the heart of the Hebrew Old Testament. This was the, the passage that everything else kind of hung on. And in fact, when I read it, you'll recognize that Jesus quoted it in the Gospels. Moses says to the people, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Sound familiar? Right? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. And, and so Jesus said, just as with the, the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, for us, this is really, really important. And, and, and part of what it's saying is we are monotheistic. We believe there is one true God only. Uh, other, other people worship other gods, yet at the same time, the other nations around Israel worshiping other gods. And, and, and what Moses is saying, what God is saying to us is, look, I'm the true God. All the others are just false gods. And so we believe there is one true God. And this one true God has revealed himself to us, beginning of all, in creation. We look around and we see evidence of God. He's revealed himself to us in Scripture. That's why we read the Bible. That's why we study the Bible, because that's where we learn about God. He's revealed himself to us ultimately in Jesus. When we see Jesus, we see God. The words of Jesus, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, the last words he spoke before he ascended to heaven. He said to his followers, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He said, this is what I want you to do and understand this idea of the Trinity. One God revealed in three persons. Now, just so you know it, if you weren't raised in church, this is a common belief. This is a common belief. Uh, the Trinity is often called the first mystery of the Christian faith. How do we understand that this whole idea of one God revealed in three persons? Because uh, all of the analogies break down. Uh, but I want you to understand to be Christian is to believe in one God revealed in three persons. In other words, all of the different tribes, all the different flavors of Christians believe this. Baptists believe it. Catholics believe it. Assemblies of God believe it. The Methodists and the Evangelical Free and the Presbyterians believe it. The Lutherans and Calvary Chapel and the Nazarenes and the Christian Church, non-denominational, all agree there's one God revealed in three persons. This is a foundational belief of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And if you struggle to grasp the concept, welcome to the club. It, it, that's why it's called a mystery. Because the analogies don't serve a purpose. Like, for instance, I'm a man, and, and yet I, I, I'm a husband, and I'm a father, and I'm a son. Okay, but that 
doesn't convey the fullness of the Trinity of three persons. I just play three roles. You can go the science effect. You can say, okay, you got the, the chemical compound of H2O, right? Which makes water and steam and ice. Uh, three different manifestations at the core, the very same element. Well, that only goes so far as well. Uh, but if you want to wrestle with the picture of the Trinity, uh, I'm going to give you a book that I recommend. Some of you love this book. Some of you hate this book. Uh, it's called The Shack by William Young. Uh, it is not a theology book. Don't read it to get a theology of God. But if you want a picture of the Trinity, if you want to try to grasp that, then it's a great way to do that. Uh, it's not a literal picture of the Trinity. It's Again, it's a, it, it helps to explain the, the wholeness of it. So just going to say that's, uh, that's for your to do with whatever you want to do with that. Now, as we talk about God, there's so many attributes that I could mention and talk about, and every one of them could be a sermon, uh, actions that God does. But let me just kind of walk through a whole bunch and share and focus on one. Uh, God is creator, right? It, it all begins with him. And it doesn't matter how you believe that God created, as long as you understand that God is the initiator. If you believe that God created the world in six 24-hour days, great. If you believe that God uh, used a big bang and he was the one who lit the fuse, great. If you believe that God somehow used evolution to bring us to this point, great. It doesn't really matter as long as you understand that God is the designer, God is the initiator, God is the cause, God is the author and architect of all that exists. God's creator, God's sustainer of life. Do you realize that we live and breathe because God allows us to? He's the one who, can, who gives us the, the, the ability to function in this world. And he's the redeemer of life. That he sent Jesus into this world on purpose to rescue us. And of course, God is the judge. Now, I don't know about you, but a, a lot of times the, the crazy world that we live in cries out for justice. Right? Anybody else get annoyed the fact that you're just sitting there going, that is so unjust, and, and I can't wait for justice to be done? Well, guess what? In the end, justice will be done because everyone must give an account of their life to God. It says in Scripture that it is appointed a man once to die and then judgment. So those who are getting away with injustice right now, they're going to give an account to God. But here's the reality. I don't really want justice for me. <laughs> I don't mind justice for other people. I don't want justice. I want grace. Because I deserve hell. And, and I don't really want it. See, that's, that's why God sent Jesus. So God is creator, sustainer, redeemer, and judge. His attributes, God is holy, he's righteous, he's loving, he's merciful, he's pure. God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent. God is all-present. He's omnipresent. God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. But the, the characteristic I want to focus on just for a few moments this morning is this. God is relational. Do you realize the story of the Bible is this? That God made us to relate to him. Genesis 1 says that we were made in the image of God. God made us for a relationship. And, of course, we destroyed the relationship through our rebellion. And not just the relationship with God. You know, because we brought sin into the world, we actually destroyed the world. Everything that's wrong with the world is, is because sin is in the world and sin breeds death. And all of us die because all of us sin. And of course, God redeemed the relationship through Jesus. He sent Jesus into this world so that we could have that relationship restored with him again. And then ultimately, God is going to complete that reconciliation when he creates a new heaven and a new earth. At the end of everything, you know, God's going to start over and, and he's going to get rid of this tainted world. And there's a new heaven and a new earth. And guess what we get? New bodies. Okay, some of you are excited. I'm excited. This one's starting to wear out, you know? I'm just kind of going, hey, you know, it's as good as I got, and I'll make do with it until I die, but I, I'm looking forward to the new one that doesn't, it doesn't have all that taint of sin on it. In other words, the God who created everything loves you and wants a relationship with you. Not a relationship where I check the box, you're in the family, but he wants a face-to-face, -face, I know you and you know me, and let's share life together relationship. 
And, and get this, God knows you. He knows your flaws. He knows your failures. He knows the filth in your life. And he still loves you and pursues you all the way from heaven through Jesus. I think that is such great news. And if you're sitting here and you're feeling kind of insignificant, unimportant, unloved, those are not biblical realities because God wants you to be with him. And, and, and I hope that that gives you that cause to rejoice, that ability, as Julie demonstrated so well, to let those, 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 those thanksgivings well up out of you because you go, hey, no matter how it is in this world, one day I'm going to be at home with God and it's going to be perfect. And I can handle it for now because it only gets better. See, that, that's reason to rejoice right there. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And let me just take a moment and, and be real practical uh, and, and share a pet peeve of mine, okay? Uh, that means, because we believe in one God revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that means it is never Jesus and God. Or God and Jesus. And, and I share that because I hear, I hear believers say that all the time. I hear people who, who say they're followers of Christ say, yeah, uh, I'm asking Jesus and God. Guys, inside of me, when you say that, there is this war going on. Because there's voices going, just smack them. <laughs> and I'm learning self-control because I don't do that. But save the, the, you know, that, that internal pain inside of me. Keep my head from exploding by, by telling yourself it's never Jesus and God because Jesus is God. He's God in the flesh. He's God the Son. So that, that's just uh, for reference so that you can be accurate in your speech. And then secondly, just real practically, it means when you pray, it doesn't matter which name you use. Uh, God, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Lord, Savior, Master, King. As long as you're directing your prayer to the one true God who's revealed himself in Scripture and in Jesus. And by the way, he knows if you're talking to him. So as you digest these truths, allow me to summarize in a way that I hope helps you understand one God revealed in three persons. The Father sent the Son. The Son saved us. The Father and the Son sent the Spirit. The Spirit leads people to the Son. I hope that helps and I hope it makes sense. So now let's talk about God the Son. God the Son. This is our statement about Jesus. Uh, again, essential beliefs. Jesus Christ came in the flesh, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to pay for our sins, was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I know that's long. I know that's a lot in a, in a statement of belief, but we wanted to be clear about how we understand Jesus. Let me just share two summations, two important points under this, uh, this about Jesus. Again, can't tell you everything about Jesus. It's a lifetime of study. But I want you to know this morning that Jesus is the one and only. Jesus is the one and only. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with John 3.16. Right, kind of, you see the signs held up at football games and stuff like that. A lot of you memorize it as the very first Bible verse that you learned. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but would have eternal life. Now, I learned that uh, a couple of different versions, like the NIV. It says that for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. How many of you learned it in the King James version? Right, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. All those summarize this one understanding that is there in the Greek, which is that there is no one else like Jesus. Never was, never will be. Jesus was not a man who became a God. Jesus, uh, we're not going to become gods like Jesus. It, Jesus is unique. There's no one else like him. Uh, he is God in the flesh, God incarnate. And by the way, this is often referred to as the second great mystery of the Christian faith. That Jesus is 100% God and he's 100% human. So he had all the power of God and yet he had all the weakness that we have. In fact, scripture says that Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet was without sin. 
He never blew it. So guys in here, I just want you to understand, when you're facing that temptation of lust, Jesus faced the temptation of lust, only he didn't give in. When you're tempted to gossip or to slander or to to think the worst about somebody, Jesus was tempted in that way, but he didn't do it. Do you you know, to me, the the greatest temptation that Jesus faced that, that he didn't, at least when I look at his life, this is how I see it, when he was there on the cross, Remember, he's God. He's got all power. He's there on the cross. He's suffering. He's dying. He's broken. He's humiliated. He's in pain. And those ignorant jerk priests come up there and start taunting him. I'm sorry. If I'm Jesus on the cross and I got all power, there is a well-placed lightning bolt that is going to drop on somebody's head. You know, suddenly there's going to be a mound of fire ants that comes up out of the ground and consumes one of those guys. Because I'm evil on the inside. Jesus had the power to come off the cross. He had the power to hurt those people, and he didn't do it. That is amazing. Why? Because he wanted to save us, you and me. He wanted us to be part of his kingdom. Again, this is classic Christianity. All the Christian churches teach that Jesus is the one and only. If they don't teach it, they aren't orthodox Christianity. Orthodox just means correct or real. So Jesus is the one and only, and we know this from the biblical witness. The biblical witness. Everything we teach about Jesus, all that we believe about God is from Scripture. Pastor O.C. shared last week about our first uh, essential belief, that we believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. What to believe. See, we're not going to microbrew our God. We're not going to create our own version of him. We're going to learn who he is from the pages of Scripture because God has revealed himself to us. So if you want to know God, if you want to have a deep relationship with Jesus Christ, read the book. Read the book. And I'm just going to tell you, if you really want to know Jesus, and my favorite part of the book, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're the story of Jesus' life. I want to see Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I want to see how he interacts with people. I want to see how he deals with adversity because that, that's what we're supposed to do. But don't stop there. I want to read the Apostle Paul and meditate on what he says about Jesus and what he says about the church and how we as people of God are to live together. I want to go and dive into Revelation because it's kind of like dessert, you know? It's like ice cream. It's like, yeah, it's all good, yeah. I want to go back to the Old Testament and read the wisdom and let it seep into my soul and hear the great stories of faith and how God is able to do all these incredible things. Because as I get to know this book, I get to know the living God and he speaks into my life and he'll speak into your life too. This is how we know him. There's so much more to say, but I want to close with our response. Our response. What difference does it make if we believe in this one true God who who became flesh to rescue us from hell? What difference does it make if we believe, if we follow Jesus, uh, it leads us to three actions. There's no way. When you encounter the living God, this is part of the equation, if you will, Uh, So here they are. When we meet God, the first response is worship. We came here to worship God. And this is our natural response to the greatness and glory of God. When you encounter the living God, you want to fall on your face and you want to proclaim his greatness. And you never want to stop. Um, Here, I'll give you an assignment. You don't have to consider an assignment. Consider it just something that's really cool. Go home today and read Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Write it down. You'll forget it otherwise. You'll be going, what were those texts? Revelation 4 and 5. And, and, and Revelation 4 and 5, two of the coolest chapters in the Bible, it gives us a glimpse into the throne room of heaven. We get to see what's taking place in heaven around the throne of God. And what you see is worship happening from the, 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 all the creatures that surround God, all the angels that are there, all the people, and it it lets us know, hey, this is what it's about. We worship God because he's worthy of our worship. When Jesus was being tempted by Satan, Matthew chapter 4, if you want to read that, uh, the last temptation, Satan shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, Jesus, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you all this. I'll let you take the easy way. You won't have to do that whole cross stuff, suffering, death, pain. And Jesus says, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. No, we only worship God. 
See, our first response to God is to worship him, to celebrate his goodness, to to give thanks for our salvation, to express gratitude and praise endlessly. Does your relationship with God draw you to worship? You know, the easiest way to check that is to look at your attitude on your way here. Were you coming expecting to meet God, excited about being able to praise your Lord and Savior with other people whose lives he's changed as well? So our first response is worship. Our second response to God is submission. We call Jesus Christ our what? Lord. Lord, right? Paul said if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So we call Jesus Lord. To claim someone Lord is an act of submission because you're calling them master and king. But true submission isn't in word, but it's in accepting his commands. It's embracing his wisdom. It's doing what he asks us to do. That's why Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Because when we understand who God is and we submit to his power, he leads us in a life of wisdom. (laughs) Jesus asked a question, the Gospel of Luke chapter 6. It's kind of a haunting question. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I command? And we're kind of like, yeah, why do you call Jesus Lord and not do what he says? But just pause for a moment. Let me, let me give you a really difficult image. If Jesus was sitting at your Thanksgiving table this week, and he looked you in the eye and said, hey, why do you call me Lord and ignore my teachings? What are you going to say? You see, there isn't a good answer. Submission is the answer. And when we know who God is, it leads us to gladly submit to His authority, His commands, and His wisdom. Is your relationship with God demonstrating your submission or revealing your rebellion? We respond to God in worship and in submission and in serving. We serve. We serve. God has called us to be his servants. God has sent us to represent him in this world. And that is an amazing privilege. It is not some kind of burden that we carry. The the king of kings, the Lord of lords, has invited us as his servants to represent him to the world that doesn't know him. Isn't Isn't that cool? God says, hey, I trust you, and I want you to make a difference in this world. And so I'm sending you out to let other people know who I am and what I'm like. That is awesome. If you, is your relationship with God leading you to serve? Now, again, here's a real easy way to kind of check your, your own life. A couple of weeks ago, we launched our serve ministry here at Calvary, and we asked everybody to fill out a card, a serve ministry card, that, that kind of says, here's where I'm interested in serving. Here's when I can serve. And we ask you to do that simply because, not because we want to rope you into doing something that you don't want to do, but because we want to inform you about opportunities to match your talents and your abilities and your time. And so, again, uh, we're just going to ask you, fill out those cards. You don't have to even get a card. Uh, By the way, they're back at the Connection Center if you want to do an actual card. You can go online to calvarylhc.com and fill it out online. Just let us know. Here's when I'm available. Here's what I can do. Uh, other things, shoeboxes. Robert already mentioned the shoeboxes. Shoe On your way out, stop by and pick up a tag. Pick up 10 of them. I don't care. You pick up a bunch. Uh, and yeah, we had a complete fail on shoeboxes, but you guys can just put it stuff in you know, shopping bags and bring it up here, and we'll, we'll stuff it in the, the bags it's going to go out in. How about this? I've challenged you to identify three or four friends that you can invite to come to Calvary when we're in the new building. Have you started thinking about who it is? Have you started praying for them? Have you started looking for opportunities to say, hey, when we get in our new worship center, are you going to come with us? Is your relationship with God leading you to serve? See, those are our responses to God. There is one God revealed in three persons. He loves us. He has redeemed us. 
today, what is your response to him going to be? First of all, do you know him? Will you choose to worship him? Will you submit to him? Are you going to choose to serve him? Let's pray. Father, today, we want to praise you because you are a great and awesome God. A God who has created everything that is. A God who has redeemed us from our sin. A God who is working in our lives right now to to bring grace and peace and hope and life to us. So, Father, this morning we simply commit ourselves to you. We confess that we're not all that good servants, that a lot of times we don't worship. And, and Lord, we want you to change our lives. We want you you to teach us more about you. Father, my prayer for everyone in this room is that this week you would reveal yourself to us in a new and fresh way. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.